Rock physics is primarily concerned with calibrating the relationship between the geology and the geophysics. Geological properties such as rock fabric, mineralogy, porosity, fluids, pressure, anisotropy and in situ stresses affect the rock's elastic properties. These in turn control the way sound waves propagate through the rock and hence control the seismic response. When we have outcrops or well data, we can measure these elastic properties either directly or via well logs and work out how they relate to the geology. For example, this plot shows the relationship between porosity and P-wave velocity VP, in a brine-saturated sandstone. We can also study the effects of fluids on a rock. Here we have VP plotted against the shear wave velocity VS, for a sandstone. Changing the porosity, for example, moves the point parallel to the trend lines. However, changing the fluid moves the point perpendicularly to the trend lines. This is something we can potentially exploit to identify hydrocarbons in our seismic. In this cross plot of acoustic impedance, P wave velocity times density, against VP over VS, we can see the effect of change in the fluid. Introducing a lighter, more compressible fluid reduces both the acoustic impedance and the VPVS ratio, as VP and density are both reduced, while VS remains fairly constant. This shows how a geological property can affect the elastic and hence seismic properties of the rock as a whole. In this particular example, we can also see that the shale plots in its own space due to its lower shear strength and hence higher VPVS ratio. So, what do we mean by elastic properties? In 1660, Robert Hooke first stated his law, ut tensio sic vis, or for non-Latin speakers, as the extension, so the force. His work concerns springs, but can be extended to all elastic materials. So if we apply a stress to a rock, it will deform in a predictable way within its elastic limits. In the isotropic case, the rock's elastic properties can be completely described by just two moduli, for example bulk modulus and shear modulus. The bulk modulus, known as K, is a measure of the rock's resistance to a compressional force. A high value means the rock is very incompressible. The shear modulus, also known as mu, measures the rock's rigidity. So if you apply a shear force across opposing faces of a block of rock, how much force is required to change its shape without a change in volume? A high value indicates high rigidity. Of course, in nature, sediments are deposited under the influence of gravity, water currents and the wind, so are generally anisotropic. During burial, the principal stress direction also affects the rock fabric. Hence, the properties of the rocks vary depending on which direction you measure them. However, if we assume rocks are anisotropic, we then need 21 different moduli to describe their properties in all directions. So normally we assume isotropy, then add the anisotropy back in at a later stage using the Thomson parameters. Unfortunately, directly measuring the incompressibility or rigidity of a rock 3,000 metres below the ground is pretty difficult. Thankfully, they can both be derived quite simply from VPVS and density logs, which are routinely acquired in wells. The Monopole Sonic tool records both P and S waves, but can only record the S wave in relatively fast formations. As fluids don't carry shear waves, the shear wave is created when the P wave enters the formation via the drilling mud. The dipole tool emits directional pulses, which create strong S waves in both slow and fast formations, although it's not as good for acquiring P wave velocities. Most modern wells are logged with both tools firing alternately, while some modern tools actually have two sets of dipole sources set orthogonally to each other, known as quadrupole. The ratio of the travel times is a measure of the acoustic anisotropy in the rock. The sonic tool is quite robust and works fairly well in a wide range of situations. However, without semblance and coherence data, it's hard to tell how well it's working. The density log is not particularly reliable in bad hole conditions, as it's a shallow reading tool and requires good contact with the borehole wall. However, it does usually come with the delta row log, which describes the size of the correction being applied, giving us a good idea of the level of confidence we can have in the reading. The tool works by firing gamma rays into the formation. These collide with electrons and become scattered. The more scattered they become, the fewer make it back to the receivers, where a low reading indicates a high electron density, and hence formation density. 
Other elastic properties such as Young's modulus, lambda, Poisson's ratio, acoustic impedance and shear impedance are simply calculated from these three logs. Poisson ratio is a particular favourite as it's highly sensitive to hydrocarbons and has fixed bounds between 0 and 0.5. Values outside these limits indicate bad data so it makes an excellent QC property too. It's also simple to express VP and VS in terms of elastic moduli. Here we can see that VP squared is equal to the bulk modulus plus four thirds of the shear modulus divided by the density. This explains the gas effect seen here. When gas is introduced into the pore spaces of a rock, the rock becomes much more compressible, reducing K and hence VP. As fluids and gases have no shear strength, the shear modulus is unchanged. However, as we add more gas, its impact on the compressibility declines, but the rock becomes less dense, so the velocity starts to climb, following Newton's second law, F equals ma. The S squared is the shear modulus divided by the density, so it simply increases with the reducing density. When we acquire seismic, all we usually measure are amplitude, time and angle, or rather offset between source and receiver. Sampling the same point on the subsurface from multiple angles allows us to observe how the amplitude changes with offset. Points are different depths but with a common geographical location and equal offset are then assembled into vertical traces before being grouped together in a seismic gather. The gathers are then muted to remove low frequency noise and direct arrivals and then they're cleaned up for AVO analysis to ensure that any changes in amplitude with angle are entirely due to the elastic contrast rather than acquisition or processing artefacts. The amplitude at normal incidence is a function of the acoustic impedance contrast between the layers, while the way the amplitude changes with angle is a function of the elastic impedance contrast between the layers. We've already seen that elastic moduli can be derived from VP, VS and Rho. The same is true of reflectivity, as is the case with the Zerpritz equations, as well as approximations such as Aki Richards and Shuey. However, reflectivity can also be calculated directly from the elastic moduli. The Hiltzman approximation to the Zerpritz equation calculates the reflectivity from acoustic impedance and Poisson ratio contrasts, while Fatty uses AI and SI, and the Gray approximation uses K and Mu. So, the way the amplitude changes with angle in our seismic data allows us to calculate the elastic contrast between layers. When combined with a low-frequency background model from our wells, for example, we can then calculate the absolute elastic properties of the rocks. Combining this with our knowledge of the relationship between the elastic properties and the geology, we can then make quantitative predictions about the geology directly from the seismic. This course is intended to outline that process.